This month, we are going to look at a photograph by Robert Cook, which shows God rays, this uh, light effect that's quite nice in an undergrowth area, in a forested area, probably under some large trees. And it looks like the photograph is in black and white, but if you look carefully at it, it's actually in color. There is a few touches of yellow here and here, and a little bit of green here. So the photograph is not pure black and white. And uh, it fooled me at first because I thought it was pure black and white, but it's actually color. And uh, that's a very interesting fact because sometimes a little bit of color adds something to the photograph. And if you take it out, if you make the photograph pure black and white, uh, something that would be very simple to do by simply totally desaturating the image, which we can do right now, putting the saturation at zero. Um, when you do that, sometimes you lose a little something. And here, as you can see, when I go back between color and black and white, we lose a little bit of uh, the brilliance of the God rays here. So I'm going to leave it in color. I don't think it's any better in black and white. The God rays are formed by the sun shining usually through a relatively small opening, either in the clouds or in a slot canyon or here in the leaves and the branches of the trees. And at the same time, the light, the sunlight, is being diffracted on something that's floating in the air. And that can be dust or it can be sand or it can be some mist or it can be a combination of things. It can be water vapor, mist or it can be dust in the air. But there has to be something floating in the air because uh, light otherwise is invisible. That is, the reason why we see God rays, why we see light, is because it is being diffracted on something that floats in the air. And the interesting thing is that you don't necessarily see that thing that's floating in the air. You, you don't see the sand, or you don't see the dust, or you don't see the haze, or the smog, or the water vapor, or whatever it might be. You see it only when a shaft of light, a ray of light, hits that, you know, those particles in the air, either water particles, or dust particles, or sand particles. So my guess is that there was something floating in the air here that was maybe dust, or maybe water vapor, or maybe a combination of both. It might be a fairly humid area, for example, or it might be a fairly dusty area, who knows. The interesting thing about the photograph is that the guard rays are very, very well demarcated. That is, there is a pattern of light and shade, of bright and darkness that's very, very strong. And that's quite uncommon. And the other thing is that they are almost in the middle of the photograph, so you have this sort of star-like pattern that you get also uh, with a lens when you shoot straight into the sun, for example. Because at that time, the light is actually being diffracted against the diaphragm of the lens. And here there might be a little bit of both, although I think it's uh, mostly God rays, but there might be a little bit of lens diffraction at the same time, it's hard to say. But what I was going to say is that the interesting thing is that the tree branches and the tree trunks sort of combine with the guard rays, so that we have actually a guard ray here that's very, very dark, and a tree trunk or a branch here, and another branch here, and another branch here. And at times it's a little bit hard to say what's a guard ray or what's a tree trunk. And so, you know, what I'm trying to express here is that there is a sort of merging of the shapes of the guard rays and the shapes of the trees and the branches branches, which is nice. And the fact that the light is shining in the middle of the photograph sort of creates that explosion of light and trees, because the trees go off also on a tangent, on a st almost on a star-like pattern, and the god rays go in the same pattern. So, you know, again, a very strong merging of the movement of the trees and the movement of the god rays, uh, sort of amplifying each other. And there is a sort of mystery to the quality of the photograph. We have an area here that's almost pure black, and I, I really don't know if there is something in it. We could, uh, you know, bring up the curves and just brighten the photograph a little bit to see if we have anything. 
you know, open up the shadows here. But no, we have nothing at all. I mean, there is no detail. So it would not make any sense to actually brighten this area because it's just pure black. And what I like about it is that it's somewhat mysterious. That is, we don't really know what is happening. And it's darker at the bottom than at the top. That is, we have a little bit of light shining through the leaves at the top. And at the bottom, we have a whole lot less than that. We have a little bit here. Uh, and I would like actually to take it out personally because I think that it's a little bit disturbing and that can be done very quickly with the clone tool which we're going to shrink a little bit like that make it more appropriate in size and we're just going to clone here and basically cover that up and what that's going to achieve is basically remove a distracting element from the foreground um, and I'm going to go to my history palette, which you can't see, but which is here. And, sorry, bring it back into the photograph. A um, little bit of movement here and there. Um, but this is before I cloned and then after I cloned. And what you can see is that the minute that I clone this highlight area, which was here, and the minute that it's gone, it's a lot less distracting in the foreground because what is happening is that this area here competes with the brightest area which is here and the minute that it's gone it no longer competes and we can focus on that and really we don't need that detail in the foreground it just so happens that some of the light some of the sun rays are hitting the ground and they became you know obviously part of the photograph but in truth for the half of the photograph for the best effect to let's say amplify the effect of the photograph and drive the eye to where we want to see and not you know anywhere randomly we have to take them out and that's a simple matter and uh, there's no nothing wrong with doing that so to go back to what i was saying it's darker at the bottom of the image than at the top of the image and the interesting thing is that in uh, western world visual metaphor so to speak it's common to have the land darker than the sky and one of the reasons for that is simply that we believe that you know heaven heaven is above and hell is below so we have the brightest part at the top of the image and the darkest part at the bottom of the image and that's just a metaphor you know that's used throughout the western world and if you look at paintings you will very very often see that and of course when you have a photograph or a painting or an image that does not follow that metaphor uh, an image where the land is brighter than the sky you have an inverted metaphor and it makes a whole lot less sense and very often this kind of photograph or this kind of image that have the land brighter than the sky are very confusing they somehow um, feel heavy at the top um, very often you might feel that something is wrong and of course if people are not fluent in the language of photography then automatically they think that something is off something's wrong something's not quite working right but they really don't know what it is. They can't quite explain it. You'll find uh, very few people that will look at a photograph that has the sky darker than the land and that are going to say, wow, you know, it's an inverted metaphor. You know, really the sky should be brighter because that's heaven in our world, you know, in our culture. So, you know, something um, good, you know, about the fact that the mystery, the darkest part, is at the bottom, that is the most mysterious area of the photograph is here at the bottom where um, the, la the deeper shadows are. So, you know, that's about it for this photograph. I really don't see much that I would do to improve it um, except cloning, like I did, the foreground, the sp splashes of light in the foreground, which did not do much. Uh, and distracted the eye. Besides that, I like it as it is. I think that the, it's a very nice photograph and I like the shapes of the trees. If I had the original file, I might try to brighten a little bit here to reveal the shape of the trees maybe a little bit better, but that's really something that I can't do here because there is not enough information left. It's too dark. The minute I try to brighten it, uh, we lose everything as I shown before. So I'm not going to try. And perhaps it wouldn't work. Um, that's really, 
you know, a very strong possibility. Uh, the other option would be to do two versions, a black and white, and then the color version, or the very light color version, like we have here, and see which one works best. And that's probably best seen on a print in uh, a... Uh, screen image like this, very so little color that we don't really have the material to make a call and, and you have to make a print. So I, what I would do is, uh, as a suggestion, is making a black and white print and then printing the image as it is here in color. Uh, I'm tempted to say quote unquote in color because there's so little color and see which one prints out the best. And uh, that's what I do. I have a number of photographs uh, in my work, the most well known being uh, Spider Rock in Snowstorm, that look like they're black and white but are really color photographs. There's very little color, but the little bit of color that is there is very, very important. And I try to print these images in black and white. It's very simple to do a black and white version. Obviously, you desaturate or you convert to black and white, or you use a filter like Black and White Darkroom Pro or you know some other method. And uh, I tried to do a black and white version, and I printed it along with a print of the color version. And the color version had that extra little something that made it that much more attractive, and the black and white version looked dead. Uh, in comparison, although the color was very minor. So I know exactly, you know, what is going on here. But, you know, it's always worth trying a black and white version and seeing uh, how it comes out. So again, a very nice photograph by uh, Robert Cook and uh, very few changes this time. In uh, previous print reviews, we've done a lot of changes to the photograph. We've seen images that required a lot of you know, fine-tuning, so to speak. And here, a photograph that just uh, works as it is with just the little blotches of light in the foreground. So, very good job, and uh, until the next print review, uh, I wish uh, you all uh, the best with your photography.